Hi, it's uh, great to talk with you today, Bryony. Um, uh, we are, of course, now close colleagues, um, having once been head of faculty and member of faculty. Um, but of course, you've uh, you've been through three different continents, I believe, in your musical education. Um, perhaps you'd like to just briefly outline the journey you took to get to the Royal College of Music. Absolutely, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, so I grew up in New Zealand. Uh, my parents are British, so I think there was always an expectation that I would eventually end up in London. Um, but so I did my undergrad in viola and actually voice as well in New Zealand. And then I decided to take a little pit stop in New York where I did my master of music at Juilliard. And then I, I sort of got to a point where I, was still looking for more in terms of studying and the study experience. And actually my brother was already studying at the college as a bassoonist at the time when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And he was loving his time so much there at, um, that I thought that it would be a really great idea to go and audition. So I was really lucky to um, have a good audition and really enjoyed meeting you and some other people. And um, it was very clear actually from the moment that I stepped in the college that it was exactly where I needed to be. And so I, in fact, not only did a two year artist diploma, but I happened to join a string quartet at the end of that. And they said, oh yes, by the way, we're actually going to do an artist diploma at the college. So I ended up staying for two artist diplomas there, which um, were really wonderful and a great experience. Um, having had such a, a breadth of, of different approaches and educational style, what would you say was different or unique about, about the approach at the college? I think that what I love about uh, the UK in general, but also at college, is the fact that there is no expectation to do one single thing. Um, what I experienced in my experience while I was in America, uh, especially, was that people really wanted to pigeonhole you into sort of one you know, if you're going to be an orchestral player, you're going to spend your entire time practicing excerpts so that you can get a job in an orchestra or, you know, if you you can do something else or whatever. Whereas at college, I feel like there was a real embracing of every source of type of music making, whether it's playing a solo recital one day, or playing in a quartet the next, and then having an orchestra project the week after. Um, there was a really great balance that I could experience there and just an expectation actually that you you do do everything because that's the whole point of of music you know you, you don't want to be pigeonholing yourself at any point and each thing contributes to the other. Great and you've you kind of stuck around since then really haven't you? Well I wasn't joking when I said you'd never get rid of me. <laughs> I do love the college a lot and um, actually I had such a positive experience studying with Andre Vitovich um, that it transpired that I was able to continue to assist him by teaching his students um, and it's been a really wonderful partnership to to work with him and to work with the really talented viola players in his class so it's been really a huge privilege to work with them. Uh, I mean your work at the college is, is of course greatly appreciated and 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 uh, the quartet is 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 still very active as well. But I mean, you you've you have also been very very busy within the orchestral field. Um, as, as you go through these various different uh, sort of uh, aspects of your professional life, what does it mean to you to be a, a Royal College of Music alumna? Well, I I suppose it's. Um being part of a special club really I mean as even now I, I meet people who were at college and there is instantly an understanding between the two of us that you know oh well you you came from the same place we we understand each other um but it's also just you know wherever I go I'm incredibly proud to represent the college and it's you know it's the sort of place that I, I did actually dream of studying at when I was young I, I looked up the college website as a teenager and I really wanted to go so it's it really was a dream 
to to be able to complete my studies there and, and now also to teach so it's yeah it's it's a really special community to be a part of and you continue to be a member of that community even after you finish studying but you you must miss home of course i do yeah especially at the moment because it was very difficult to travel obviously um but i think the nice thing is that there are lots of Kiwis over here and um, I always really enjoy meeting them. In fact, there's quite an Im impressive Kiwi contingent in the college throughout all of the different faculties. And so it's always really nice to, to hear that familiar Kiwi accent across the room. <laughs> um, I mean, despite your success, I guess still uh, of early days in, a, in, in what will hopefully be a long and successful career, what is yet to do? What, what, what do you have a burning ambition to, to get involved with that you haven't yet? Oh, well, it's a, that's a really good question. But also, I feel like there's just so much more to explore within what I'm doing currently. So I, I think that the, the biggest realisation that I've had in the last few years is that I never want to stop being a student and I never want to stop studying scores and trying to get to the bottom of things you know it's it's just the the really great thing that I realized is that you know all of the things that you study at college if you choose to make it just the beginning of your quest for knowledge um, then it means that you can study these sorts of things for a lifetime I mean it's it's kind of insane when I think about all of the classes that I did on on harmony or you know air training ev everything that all contributes to the way that I approach analyzing scores and figuring out how to plan a string quartet um, and also teaching I mean it's it's all it's all really related and so I guess there's for me there's not one particular thing that I desperately want to do it's more about diving deeper into the world of everything that I am doing currently. Okay. Uh, I mean, if you can throw your mind back a, a few years, uh, not too many <laughs> years, to the beginning of your undergraduate studies, what do you know now that you wish you'd known then? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I it's, a, it's an interesting question to ask, especially now when we have so much time on our hands um, that I think that I would have told myself to use my time responsibly. <laughs> um, <laughs> not that I didn't, but I, I think it took quite a long time for me to figure out that actually practicing is a really helpful thing to do. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the more that you practice, the more that you can create a foundation for yourself. Um, the easier it is to do everything else when the demands are placed on you. So, you know, not only and not only should you spend that time in the practice room, but you should take the time to get to know people, to explore things and, you know, take it seriously, but enjoy your spare time as well. Something like that. I think that's pretty good work-life balance, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Great, um, Bryony, it's fantastic to talk to you. Uh, thank you so much um, for everything that you said um, about uh, college. Um, but, you know, the, the compliments go both ways because having been a, a great asset as a student, you're now a, a very close and trusted colleague. Um, uh, I look forward to seeing you again in person very soon. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Bye. All right. Alice, it's wonderful to talk to you today. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to, to have this conversation. Um, it's, been, it's been a, a while since you left college. When, we, when were you with us? I was at college from 2004 to 2008. So that's a really long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> and what have you been doing with your life since 2008? Poof. Okay. Uh, um... Lots of things, lots of things. I basically, I got, I, I was quite fortunate in 2008 that I actually joined a small chamber ensemble that 
uh, used to, um, as of last year, do lots of concerts. That's the um, Samasa in the Fields, the church just off Trafalgar Square. So I was quite fortunate that that sort of sprung me into freelance world of bass playing in uh, chamber ensembles and orchestras. So I was really fortunate. And then through that um, meeting people, I just basically grew my freelance career as a double bass player and um, built it up. And it took quite a while, but I reckon after about five years, it was fully, is pretty good. Um, and I've just been enjoying it ever since. So I do a lot of work with big symphony orchestras all across the UK, chamber orchestras. Um, I do a little bit of teaching to bump that up, the bit of the income up. And I really enjoy education outreach work. Um, so I sort of threw myself into that. Just in fact, during the end of my college years, I met a few people that um, work really heavily in certain education outreach departments. So the Royal Abbott Hall and LSO Discovery. And I became really good friends with them and then worked with them and that kind of grew as well. So that's kind of what's been happening. Um, yeah, and it all changed this year, but up till that point, it was lovely going in and out of orchestras and touring and having lots of time and playing my double bass, it's good, yeah. Great. And of course, uh, you've been working with a, a great friend of mine, Nikki Benedetti. Uh, how, did yes. you, how did you get involved with, with Nikki? So, oh, Nikki, she is just an absolute angel. She, we love Nikki. I met, I've met Nikki on and off over, well, since leaving college, on and off playing in orchestras and then she'd be there soloing and I'd just go and chat to her. Um, and she's lovely. So I met, I've met her on and off from a performing point of view, but then um, I really got to know her because I was doing a project at the Royal Abbott Hall with the education department there. And they'd invited Nikki to come along and do a workshop um, for college students, uh, the academy students and Royal College students. And I think they might have invited some Guildhall students as well. So um, Nikki was running it and I was there with the double basses basically helping out. And we got chatting um, and we've got very similar views of education outreach and things. So then when she started her foundation, which is about a year old, it's really quite new. Uh, she got in touch with me and invited me along to help help out with the foundation and um, and it's amazing it, she's got just the most amazing exciting enthusiastic people on her team to teach children of all ages and to inspire kids and also to support teachers parents guardians and she's sort of got everything covered so yeah so we just that's we just get on and have a lovely time and make music and inspire people, hopefully. So yeah, she's great though. Love Nikki, yeah. So so if we turn the clock back, um, uh, not too many years, but uh, I mean, you were talking about inspiring people with, with your work. Who, who was it to, or what was it that inspired you to, to take up the bass? So, oh wow, okay, so that, yeah, that's a, that's a many years ago, but, the main thing that inspired me initially was my youth orchestra. I was from, I'm from Brighton, Sussex. So the Brighton Youth Orchestra down there is the most amazing bunch of people. And they were really supportive and really inspiring. Um, and then I, through them, met Matthew Gibson, who's a double bass player of the London Symphony Orchestra. And he was probably my first main inspiration. He's just such a gentleman, an amazing bass player. And I just wanted to do what he could do on the double bass. And then through that, I started to investigate who taught the double bass at various places. Um, and I then got in touch with Caroline Emery, who was my teacher for most of Royal College. I went to junior department with her, and then I went to senior college. Um, and then I switched to Tony Huffam at, who's from the Royal Opera House. And I just loved that world of the opera world. 
Um, and I, I, that was all my inspiration. I was like, oh, this is all amazing. I want to do what they can do. You know, what Tony does in a pit in the opera house, I want to do that. So I sort of, and what Matt does in the LSR, I want to do that. So that was kind of my draw, if you like. Yeah. Great. And uh, I mean, you, you described it, what a full diary you, you had as a, a freelance player and hopefully will have again very soon. Um, and, and I kind of know what it's like being a full time freelancer. You, you spend a lot of time, you know, in the car or on the train and, uh, and, and the dates are fantastic. But actually, when you're successful, it doesn't leave a lot of time for anything else. So uh, during this, this, this last few months, have you thought about perhaps other aspects of playing or other types of playing stuff that you would l like to explore that perhaps you haven't had the opportunity to? Definitely. Yeah, that's a really good question because you do just put in the orchestral dates in the diary and fly around doing it and have a great time doing it. But with that all gone, it has made me go, well, I love orchestras, definitely. But I have actually been drawn to certain really amazing solo pieces um, and very small chamber pieces that have been really, I've had the time to learn them in lockdown one and two. And, um, and also you kind of, it's forced one to take a step back and go, I don't have to do orchestra every single day of my life. If I don't want to, I could prepare, you know, Bottasini, Grand Concertante and, and have a lovely time playing crazy solo music as well I could do that so um yeah definitely it sort of draw my eyes to different types of music and yeah just yeah explore more stuff definitely yeah great uh, as you go through your career um perhaps it might be quite difficult to articulate but but what does it mean to you to be a an alumna of the RCM uh is I think, what does it mean to me? I think the main thing is the amount of amazing friends and musicianship that come along with it, that you take from, that I've taken from Royal College. So even now I'm bumping into people that I was at college with, they're, incredible musicians and we're all friends and we make music together regularly and that is huge that is like we're still in touch and then you know when things are back to normal or when things were normal in orchestras you know you're bumping into people that maybe you haven't seen for a while but then you can kind of click back into it and be like oh we were at college together and do you remember that awesome concert we did with Heitink or something that was amazing and Mala too wow wasn't that great and you can reminisce and stuff but they stick with you and you keep bumping into people um and and also intriguing how a lot of musicians are I mean like Nikki is in, she's incredible. She's incredible. And you bump into all these people, but you can also bump into people who've done different things as well. They've just taken their own slightly different path, I don't know, teaching or chamber music or whatever. Um, so I think for me, it's the, the music that sticks with you and the friendships and the memories and the fact that you, you're you still going almost, you know, yeah, I guess. Um, one last question um, to put you on the spot. I've been asking everyone this. so. Um, with your all of your wisdom and experience uh, that you have now is there something that you know now that you wish you'd known when you first started your undergraduate course at the RTM not necessarily known but I wish I'd taken more advantage of the library <laughs> the library has got so many uh, everything it's got everything in it and I just didn't take advantage I think I sort of clocked that the library was a, just had so much stuff in maybe my last year and suddenly went oh my god all this music and tried to and there's not enough time I think if I yeah I think go to the library and use the practice rooms and and ask people questions you know yeah I'd use all the resources so to give you your due, I mean, you weren't exactly idle and doing nothing. Uh, 
So, you know, I, I think you were one of the busiest people I um, I knew at the college. So, you know, all, all credit to you. And, and indeed, I guess that's how you make so many great contacts. Um, so, uh, listen, Alice, it, it's just amazing to talk to you. Kept up. I actually saw you at the Albert Hall at that at that. And as he gig, I don't know if you remember, I was there with the with the crew from the RTM. Oh God, of course you were. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was so fun. We were playing something really nice. Bartok. As well. Maybe it was, it was Bartok. It was Bartok. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It was really cool music. Yeah, and Hetty was there as well. She was guiding the cellos, and yeah, a nice gang of people. Yeah. Oh, it's fun. Yeah, love it. Lovely to talk to you, um, and um, I'm sure we'll catch up again soon, and hopefully in person before too long. In real life, amazing. Can't Great. wait. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks Mark. Alice. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Daniel, it's it's really great to meet with you this morning. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Um, uh, I, I'd like a, 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 to start with, I think, just to wind the clock back a little bit to, to, to your early days as a harpist, because you actually started the harp very early, didn't you, I think? Was it age five? I did, and yeah. Can, can you remember what, what prompted you, what inspired you to, to want the harp? Yeah, so my, my sister um, plays the violin and uh, she's nine years older than me. And I remember my mum taking her to junior college, junior RCM. And um, every, every Saturday, and I used to tag along. And I remember um, when she was rehearsing uh, in orchestra, uh, orchestral re rehearsals in the concert hall, the harp room used to be just towards, just on the, the, the left-hand side there. Um, which would now be the, the green room, I'm guessing. Um, <clears throat> and the, the harp room was in there, so I just strolled in there and uh, Daphne was in there teaching. And I remember her um, getting me on a, a stool and, and helping me to play uh, Bar Bar Black Sheep. That was my first, my first uh, experience of playing the harp. And it was just, just the size of the instrument at the back of the orchestra that attracted me to it. And I was three at the time, and I was way too small to, to start. So I started when I was five. Great. And then you, you spent uh, six years with us at the, at the Royal College, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and also one of the few exalted winners of the Tagore Gold Medal. Uh, as, as recognition for, for your, not only your, 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 your progress, your development, but your achievements and your contribution at college. How, how did that feel at that moment? At graduation? Yeah, at the Tagore, when you, were, when you knew that you got that, that special. Oh, gosh. I, I, I wasn't expecting it at all. Um, so that was at the graduation for my master's degree. And... Um, yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't believe it really. I'm I I often think back at uh, when I when I won that. How how long ago was that now? Two thousand and eight. Um, and I'm still I'm still filled with pride and also not sure why I won it either. <laughs> it's a bit of kind of wow. Thank you so much for for thinking of me and putting me forward for that and yeah it, it was just it was surreal it was surreal it was like an oscar moment i'm, I'm guessing i don't I, i'm not sure yet i need to win an oscar so um so so then then you left us um what what sort of stuff have you been doing um since then and 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 and, and what were the initial steps into a professional career that um, so the, the year I left, I think it was the following year, 2009, um, uh, I did the uh, London Philharmonic Orchestra Future First Scheme, which is great because you get to rehearse with the orchestra, um, play concerts with them. Some, some of them they choose uh, what, what you do, do educational outreach with them. I remember doing educational outreach 
in a library with uh, their, uh, one of their educational uh, leaders there um, in Brixton. So it, I did travel, I'm, I'm based in North London. Um, so that was quite varied um, within that year of doing things. Most of what I do now is orchestral, which is the thing I love doing. I think actually that was one of the things that professors and staff thought about when they were considering me for the, the Tagore Gold Medal, is that I was always, uh, I always wanted to, to be an orchestra. And so if someone dropped out or anything like that, then I, I would be there. And I think I, I was doing a lot of orchestral playing, even at college, which was amazing. And so, yeah, just moving forward, I that, that's most of what I do is orchestral stuff. So um, on stage live concerts with various orchestras um, and I do a few sessions and a tiny bit of teaching, not at your level, Mark. <laughs> Good. And um, I mean, it, the last 10, 12 months has, has uh, affected us all in some way. Uh, how have you been? How have you been filling your your days and your hours since March last year? I've I've tried to keep to a schedule. I think I work well when I have a schedule. If I have nothing to do, this is just me personally. I think that from a day to day uh, on a day to day basis, that uh, my it just I just collapse in terms of not having something to work towards. So. It's been a little bit like being back at college because I'm not expected to go out and work. I'm not expected to, to get ready in the morning to go out to do a rehearsal and then a concert. So I've got, I've got that time back, which is, which is in some ways priceless and no one can blame me because everyone's in the same boat, more or less. Unless, unless you're a, a big time session musician, in which case you can continue doing what you're doing to a certain degree. But it's that time so you can practice, you can cover repertoire that now looking back, I think that's what I would have done even more at college is co covering even more repertoire because that time, now I see it, you just don't, you don't get that back, you're, you know, the expectation on you is for you to be studying and so yeah that's going back to what I've been doing in the last 12 months yeah practice uh, DIY and just regular exercise as well which I'm quite pleased that I've been able to do that at home. <clears throat> Great. Are, are, there, are there things in your career that I mean, different aspects of, of playing or perhaps different styles, different types of playing, different areas of, of exploration that you would like to, to do but haven't yet done? Mm. I, I, I've done a few sessions. Um, I, I, would love to, I would love to go into that more, actually. I'd love to, I'd love to be in Abbey Road, a lot more than I am at the moment. I'd love to do that. Um, I did. I did a Sting tour with the Royal Philharmonic Concert Orchestra in 2010, um, and that that was amazing. So we recorded Sting's album, and then just toured around the world, promoting that. Um, and that that's that's kind of as a classical musician, it's once in a blue moon you you do that type of thing. There's not many uh, pop musicians that uh, require a full symphony orchestra. So that, that, that area I'm quite interested in as well, actually. Um, yeah, I think it's, it, it's about versatility that will get me there, I think. Right. Yeah. Um, as you go through your, your professional life, what does it mean to you to be uh, an alumnus of the Royal College of Music? That's a good question. What does it mean? Um, I, 
I th- I, I'm going to be quite blunt. I think be, being at that college has has put me up for consideration with work. Uh, because of the name, because of the launch pads that it's given me. Um, and when people see when people see that name, they take you seriously. And and for that reason alone, I'm very pleased that I did. I I, I went. To, I, I you know I don't have to say I won the Tukulga Medal. The RCM having a, a degree there is is enough. And I think that that it's it's a launch pad. And yeah, and I, I hope I'm not being too blunt by saying that I mean, you're, it, you're, you're you're very kind in your comments about uh, about the college and uh, you know i i have to concur in in some degree i i don't think either you should uh, run down your own abilities because it might get you into consideration but of course you, you still have to deliver the goods to the people you know sure. sure i think i think it does it it, it 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 jars the door open at least for the gap for you to prove yourself yeah yeah one last question, I guess, and, and, you, and you've perhaps touched on this when you were talking about covering lots of repertoire, but yeah. if you, is there something that you know now that you wish you'd known when you started music as a first year undergraduate? Um, yeah, two, two things. Um, you never get that time back being at college, you never get the, the, the time back to, to learn your craft in terms of covering repertoire. You don't get the time back to, to, to play with other people. So as an orca- I, I see myself in as an orchestral musician. Um, and I guess I'm asking myself, what would I do differently at college if I went back? I do a lot more chamber music because I think that ch- the chamber music is the, the cornerstone of every uh, orchestral musician. It should be anyway. And so I do a lot more chamber music at college. I cover, I try to cover a lot more repertoire. Um, and also just be a little bit more proactive. I, I feel like I was late to the game when I left college, I think that there there are two different two different parties of musician that leave college. There's proactive, and then there's people who are a bit slow to the game. And I, I put myself in that category. I'm not now because I know what I need to do. And I think that second thing would be to be proactive, make contact with orchestras if that's what you want to do. Whatever area you want to go into, try and make that contact even at college. Um, Because when you leave, it's possibly too late. Your peers have already, some of your peers would have already made contact. Um, So you wanna wanna make that contact. Um, I think that's, yeah. 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 Well, late to the game or not, you you seem to be doing okay for yourself, Daniel. And uh, you know it, it's wonderful to catch up again. Um, and uh, I still remember the the days very clearly of your of your participation in 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 your in the many musical activities at college. Um, modest as always, but uh, but I I remember your wonderful playing as well as your modest personality. So thank you. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to catch up again. Um, best of luck with everything. And, uh, and I hope we have the chance to catch up again soon. Thanks, Daniel. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thanks. Yeah. So, Laura, thank you so much for joining me today to have this chat. Uh, it's wonderful to see you again and to catch up. Um, uh, you are one of those people, I think, who uh, 
uh, has the uh, the privilege of being the composer performer or the performer composer. I think something which perhaps uh, our 21st century musicians are missing. Um, were these always dual interests for you or did you develop one out of the other? Yeah, they were always together, but actually I think I was writing before I started playing the guitar because mm -hmm. I was composing little songs on a tape player and um, yeah, like composing lyrics, composing melodies, even though I couldn't play an instrument. So I recorded them on the tape player so I could remember how they went. And that was actually the first musical activity I did. Uh -huh. and, and what age was that? Like eight or nine. Okay. And, and then guitar <laughs> came how soon after that? Pretty soon, yes. I started learning at my primary school. Um, and then I was writing little tunes, mostly to play on the guitar or songs and things like that. And then obviously when I did GCSE, you have to compose. So I wrote for that. Um, but then I think when I got to college, I started writing much more widely and for much wider range of instruments and getting really into it. So, so would you say your, your sort of, uh, your style, if you like, was very much in tune with, with being a guitarist at the, at the, at the outset? Um, yeah, maybe, I guess I was, writing I was writing a lot of songs I think mm -hmm. so it was almost the idea of playing the guitar and singing or that that kind of tradition mm -hmm. and uh, and then when you got to when you got to the college uh, how did how did that balance work for you did you did you feel that you were able to explore both equally was there one you felt that the college took more seriously or less seriously how how did that work for you well, I think it ended up in two kind of avenues because in my first year at college, I met Rory Glasheen, who's a percussionist, and we started um, a folk group together called Tirolis. And through that, I was writing a lot of songs um, and we were arranging folk material and stuff like that. But then I was also doing composition as a second study. Um, so it wasn't so pressured in terms of exams and things because as a second study, it's a bit less intense. Um, but in a way that just gave me the opportunity to develop it at my own pace. And actually now that I've left college, I'm doing more composition than ever, I think. Um, so in, in the balance of what you do, how, how is that working currently? But also how, how much do they intertwine and, and how much are they separate? Yeah, I think they're quite intertwined nowadays because I remember, I think it was in about 2015, where I wrote my first solo guitar piece. Because up till then, I know I mentioned that I'd written for guitar when I was little, but I'd mostly been writing just, you know, whatever you came up, like an oboe and percussion piece or a harpsichord piece or all these different things. Um, but then I thought it would be really nice to try and integrate what I'm doing a bit more because it felt a bit like the two were quite separate. Um, so I wrote a, a piece for myself to play and I felt really, really nervous doing that for the first time. Um, but now that's become kind of the norm. So in most of my concerts, I'll do two or three of my pieces usually, and that's growing all the time. So it does feel increasingly integrated, I think. Um, I mean, I know one always sees oneself as uh, as unique in some respects, but actually at an intellectual level, do you do you see yourself as part of a tradition of composer performers as they might have existed in, say, Baroque or classical times? Well, I think with the guitar, there's quite a big tradition anyway of composer performers, um, you know, running through the whole time, maybe because um, the guitar is quite difficult to compose for if you're not a guitarist, um, because it's just a tricky instrument to get your head around. It's slightly annoying to write for in many ways. Um, so I guess I see it as part of that tradition. Um, so there's actually a lot of the repertoire that guitarists play, whether it's from the 20th century or before, was written by guitarists. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, obviously we're in slightly strange times at the moment, uh, but in terms of your, your guitar career, um, would you like to give us a sort of description of the kind of work that you do and, and how broad and how diverse that might be as well? Yeah, so prior to all of the current situation, I was touring a lot. 
I was going to the US and various places in Europe to play solo guitar concerts. Um, I'd recorded a concerto with Deutsche Symphonie Orchestra Berlin, which was a newly written concerto. But then I'd also done other completely unrelated projects, like I'd recorded an album with Charlie Fink, who's the frontman of the band Noah and the Whale. So that had been fairly diverse as well. I think at the time, I would say I was probably, let's say 60, 70% of my time was on performing and the rest on composing. Um, whereas now I'm doing much more composing because there's no concerts happening. <laughs> sure, okay. As you as as you develop as a as a musician and as you as you become more well known uh, globally, what does being an RCM alumna mean to you? Um, I think when I was at the RCM, I met a lot of really great people. So I think a lot of the projects that I've ended up being involved with are through connections that I made when I was at the RCM like with the folk group, also Juyon Sir, violinist, who's my best friend, but also um, she um, is a really interesting collaborator. We've worked a lot on various composition and performance projects together. Um, and I think there were other things at the RCM that may be a bit behind the scenes, like the Alexander Technique or the Creative Career Center that for me were both really, really influential. So I think I carry through quite a lot of those influences to my life today. Great. And, and from your experiences, uh, at, at your time at college, but also uh, out in the in the profession, what do you know now that you wish you'd known when you first started at the Royal College of Music? Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, I think being a musician can be quite mentally challenging. And I maybe wasn't completely aware of how difficult it could be and um, didn't have all the tools available. So I sort of wish maybe I'd found out a bit more about that earlier um, and received more help earlier, which I think I ended up getting into that a bit later on. Mm -hmm. Great. OK. And uh, uh, in terms of your your own development and, and your eye to the future, I mean, uh, obviously, to some degree, we're reactive to, to, to the opportunities that come along. But but what's on your list of things that you have yet to do, but you would love to do? Um, I have quite a lot of creative projects that I want to do, pieces I want to write um, that are maybe on a bit of a bigger scale. Um, so I think it's mostly just particular creative ideas and things that I want to express. Um, but more and more, I think I mostly just want to have a nice life <laughs> and, um, you know, be like, sort of feel well and happy. So I don't mind too much exactly what I do. I almost feel that I'm less ambitious now than I was. Um, but I certainly have just various creative things that I'd like to do. Great. Okay. Laura Snowden, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, wonderful to have a chat with you and to catch up. Um, best of luck with all of your projects. And, uh, and I'm sure you'll be on the road again very soon. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, thank you very Bye -bye. much. Hi, Claire. It's lovely to be with you today. Um, uh, of course, it's, it's a few years since you were a student at the Royal College of Music. Um, but I know you've kept in close contact uh, with us since then. Um, and uh, a wonderful array and div uh, a diversity of activities that you've, uh, that you've managed to initiate and, uh, since, since you left the college. So just in a few words, perhaps if you can sum up the sort of work you're doing and, and if you like the sort of music making you enjoy doing the most as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's a pleasure to see you again. And um, it's really lovely. The fact that having spent so much time at the Royal College, it, it makes me look back with fond memories, warm memories. And, and also um, it was a time where 
I really believe thoroughly I probably won't get back again because you focus solely on your instrument and you're enjoying being immersed in all the experiences you can get there. And I think it prepared me for a career that was going to be hugely diverse. I mean, there's no two days that are the same, of course, as many musicians will be feeling that way uh, these days, um, especially at this point in time um, at the moment. But um, it's it's very much a, a mixture, really, that I do. I uh, often perform as a soloist, and I'd be very fortunate to do concertos with some of the, the orchestras all over the world, really. Travelled internationally to do uh, chamber performances as well, um, and solo work, and I've recorded quite a bit. I've carved sort of uh, a kind of niche for myself in that industry where um, I uh, managed to sort of um, hit on really a sound world that didn't really exist before between harp and strings. And my husband, Chris, he is a composer and arranger who helped me to achieve that. And so I've recorded with people like the English Chamber Orchestra, the Philharmonia, and fortunately I signed with labels such as Universal and Classic FM along the way. Um, and of course, you know, one of the probably major mi milestones people will know me for is my post as the former official harpist to Israel Harpist, uh, Israel Highness, the Prince of Wales, of course, um, which I fortunately uh, was appointed when I was at the Royal College. So it was my final year at the Royal College. I'm sure you can remember that, um, <laughs> that day when that happened. Uh, that must have been uh, an, an incredible moment. Uh, I mean, do you feel that within all of the different range of activist activities that, that you have do you feel that that sets you on a on a certain path did it have a, a, a significant influence in what you did after that yeah absolutely like being from wales one of my major goals was to hopefully to be the Royal Harpist one day, as I really felt it could really set me on that path to help me launch my career, to give it a springboard. And that's exactly what it did. I played 180 times for the Royal Family. Um, and I also played in all the Royal Residences. And um, of course I played at the Royal Wedding for William and Kate as well. So that really catapulted me into that sort of um, scene of being kind of a commercial player as such in a way, because I had to do like about, I think it was 800 live, um tv networks at the time you know and so it really puts you to the test and and really sort of makes you uh, approach things a bit differently because obviously with the harp being quite a niche instrument as well in the kind of common regard um i was really trying to sort of spearhead and fly the flag for the instrument and not just that really for um my whole background of, of the education i'd had so um so it certainly did give me that that really special time in my life to to launch it my career now if we if we turn the clock back even further than that of course uh when you were uh, when you first came to the royal college of music i also knew you as as a violinist um sure. it, it what what prompted you what directed you what directed you in the in into the into the harp as opposed to the to the violin or indeed did you have other options that weren't music related as well Absolutely. Well, my story is a little bit different and actually I think looking back now really unique because in a way um, I don't know that many people who might have maybe done what I did in that way because of the fact that I went into the college as a violinist and after a year of playing I was obviously doing the harp as a second instrument and my wonderful teacher Yayan Jones was so inspiring and so encouraging I loved both instruments and he was saying to me well why don't you do joint first do do both you know and it came to the point where there were physically not enough hours to do both I felt to do justice to both instruments and I can remember now I don't know if you remember I came into your office and I sat down with you and I explained explained my situation and uh, the reason I say I, it's unique that situation is because the fact that you were so willing to allow me to swap to the harp as an instrument from there on in the second year of my degree it would have been very easy not to be able to swap at that point but goodness me look what you know in the way looking back now I'm so thankful that you said yes because my career would have been just very different it just would have turned out differently hopefully in, in a nice way but on the other hand the opportunities that I uh, you know uh, was ex as exposed to and obviously through the royal position and and through all of the different sort of experiences I had you know I could um, I really could have had a very different career in that way so I'm you know always be thankful for that definitely and 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 looking ahead, I mean, you 
you kind of have a, such a full life and a, and a family life as well. Um, it, you're one of those people, I, I, I think, have you managed to create so many hours in the day sometimes? But uh, is there anything that you would like to do still that you haven't yet got around to? Oh, definitely. There's always stuff that you want to do. And, and me in particular, I'm so passionate about my instrument in which I know many people watching this will be feeling exactly the same. Now is the time to really put the time and effort into that sort of creating opportunities, being in that, that sort of surrounding like the RCM where you can kind of forge relationships forever. You know, I have people who are best friends still with me now since my time in RCM. And I have people that we, we sort of share work and we sort of keep in contact and I create projects with people as well. And that probably is the biggest bit that I want to keep on doing really is I'm kind of seeing myself as yes, a musician and I'm, I'm very much so a musician, but I'm kind of an entrepreneur in a way that I'm trying to create different projects and work and that's what I've done uh, over the years with some harp ensembles that I form for young and youth uh, level players, young professionals where I've done groups for those types of people and I've tried to mentor these people and inspire them to keep going because I feel part of my role is to be kind of hopefully some, to leave some sort of legacy. Um, I'm also really keen on um, you know developing uh, different chamber groups that I've wanted to do along the years and also I examine of course I examine a lot with um, yourselves at the Royal College and a couple of of other places and I think that experience is really important because it makes you assess yourself as a player but it also makes you assess you know in the right way and how to encourage other people to to keep going you know so um and definitely of course recording is always something I'm passionate about so I keep keep that in my in my project of things to do as well so yeah just having a variety is really important in today's profession and creating projects that will bring you um, you know, uh, obviously revenue, but also satisfaction in that sense that you feel that you've achieved something. Great. This might be a, a difficult uh, thing to articulate, um, but as, as you go through your musical life, what does it mean to you to be an alumna of the Royal College of Music? I'm really glad you asked because I'm really passionate about this one point if I had not have actually entered the Royal College of Music and have walked across Hyde Park, across past the Albert Hall and into the, the, the front doors that very first day I arrived, I don't think I would have had maybe the depth of insight that I have had into the music industry and profession right now. Looking back, that day changed my life, you know, coming to music college. I actually came from a, a state school in West Wales. I hadn't necessarily been immersed and surrounded by uh, maybe like-minded musicians. I mean by that as seriously as I was into music. Um, so it was really quite a new thing for me to be in with music school students um, and, you know, uh, sort of people from all over the world, you know, of course. And so that whole environment really was what, where I thrived. I feel like I put the hours in and I enjoyed every second of it. And I found it so interesting to see how other people would do it. And you learn so much from that. Not only just your, you know, of course you have fantastic mentors, teachers, conductors, you know, master classes, all sorts of like world-class stuff going on. But in addition to that, the social side and the support network and that environment, it was really friendly, but also good in that it sort of pushed me to work harder because you're surrounded by people who are so amazing. So I think that's possibly the lasting effect it's had on me is that it's made me really thankful that it gave me that sort of focused insight into the industry from the word go. Great. And um, if it's possible in a, in a one sentence answer, mm -hmm. um, piece of advice to people either going into conservatoire now or thinking about the future, the future of music and profession in music? I think uh, in a sentence, open-mindedness, positivity, strength, determination, commitment. Uh, those are the, probably the five things that you need to succeed right now in the music industry, because if you've got those, you know, attributes, you won't go wrong. Brilliant. Um, Claire, it's been wonderful talking to you. 
Thank you um, very much. I'm sure we will see you in the building as soon as we are allowed to see you in the building. Um, and uh, and um, good luck with all of your projects to come. Um, thank you. Claire Jones, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you. Uh, Jamal, thank you so much for joining me today for this conversation. Great that you could uh, uh, find the time. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, we worked very closely together when you were at, at college, um, which was a, a great pleasure for me, certainly. I hope it was for you also. Um, tell me uh, a little bit about what you've been doing since you left the college. Okay, so um, when was it? I can't even remember anymore, like the life has changed so much. Uh, I don't remember when I left college. Uh, it was, I think, 2019, was it? I left and since then I've been trying to, I went to Guildhall to do my, um, to do my artist diploma. And at the moment uh, I'm continuing uh, my education with uh, Thomas Carroll, the professor which I studied with at college and Yehudi Minion School. So uh, it's, as you can imagine, at the moment, life stopped a bit, but uh, since straight after college, uh, I, was, I was lucky to enough to win the uh, concert artist in America, uh, which was combined with YCAT in London. So it was, a, it was very exciting for me uh, to start uh, various different uh, concerts in the United States, as well as uh, England and Europe though it, it was uh, unfortunately stopped because of the pandemic, as you can imagine. So yeah, we didn't get to do, uh, we, we've planned a lot of exciting things, but unfortunately we had to delay uh, many of the projects that we had uh, for two years at least at the moment. So life is at the moment a bit quiet, <laughs> as you can imagine. But you, uh, you managed to develop um, a, a very close uh, working relationship with uh, the composer Fazil Tsai. Uh, yep. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so um, I had the opportunity to play with him. As uh, you, you know, he's an amazing composer and pianist as well. So we, we had a few concerts in Turkey and it was really, really good. Uh, we had a great uh, response from the people and uh, we got on really well. So he decided to we decided together to first do an America tour together, which was like, which is the late now. And also we will be recording few things and al uh, two albums together. One will be um, with his sonatas, three of his sonatas uh, with Sony uh, label and also with um, a Turkish ACM, it's his organization. We'll record all his concertos with a, with a, a symphony in Ankara. So um, it does, that's gonna be very exciting because I'm also working on Sony with um, Ho Howard Griffiths for uh, concertos, Goldman concertos, and some of his pieces. So it's, it's a, I have very exciting projects, thanks to Fazil Sai coming up. Mm. Great. Okay. Um, I mean, when you when you were at college, uh, you you explored some some interesting chamber music programs, but but I think it's fair to say that actually a lot of your focus was on was on solo performance. Um, yes. And I guess that's a lot of what you, you've been involved with since you left. Yes. Um, it, do you feel that that's something that temperamentally was, was always your, your forte, if you like, or, or do you feel that actually chamber uh, music is still something that, uh, that you would like to, to come back to uh, at some point in your career? Um, definitely. I love chamber music very much. I, I had really great opportunities to perform with such talented musicians at the Royal College. Um, it's just after that I found it a bit difficult with um, being, being able to find the time to rehearse and arrange schedules as well as doing solo, which like you say was my main thing since the, I started at the Menun School. And um, I definitely enjoy it very much, especially the trio repertoire, and I will definitely want to do it again. But at the moment, with uh, the agencies and with like with people that I'm working with, like Fazil Sai, we're concentrated on solo repertoire and solo career. And once I can get somewhere where I want to with the solo, I can definitely start doing chamber music and other things as well. So, so if we turn the clock back uh, a few years, yes. what age did you start playing the cello? I was five. <laughs> and what what inspired you to, to pick up the cello? My whole family, they were all musicians. They are 
uh, though my grandfather was the uh, cellist where he was a very well-known cellist in Azerbaijan and Turkey. So he would just practice all the time at home and we lived all together with my parents and my grandparents. And I just loved the sound of the cello. And I, 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 my, my mom is saying that I used to take two sticks and imitate. I tried to play the cello on two sticks. So they decided to make me a musician as well because my dad is a violinist, my mom is a cellist. So I, they thought it would be very good for me to do it because they could also guide me and help me whenever I needed. Great. And then you went to menu in school. What, what age were you then? I was 14, I think. Yes. And was that the first time you'd come to, to the UK? Yes, it was the first time I left home. I left Turkey and it, I, I mean, it was very uh, difficult for me at the beginning because I didn't speak any English. And it was, of course, very lucky experience for me because I got invited by Mr. Slav Rostropovich, who was the president at the time. I, I just played to him in Paris once and he, he uh, offered me a full scholarship at the Minion School. That's how I came there. That's how it started because I didn't have any plans. My parents preferred me to stay home and make sure I practiced all day uh, instead. But it was very exciting and new chapter in my life, which of course led me to Royal College of Music in the end. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, with your with your wisdom and experience of your international career, is is there something that you know now that you wish you had known when you started at the Royal College of Music as a first year undergraduate? To be honest, when I started at the Royal College of Music as an undergrad, I didn't know anything. And I don't wish now that I knew things because I think it was just perfect time for me to start at the Royal College and learn everything gradually from the age 19 because before that, yes, I was at, I had great education at Yehud Dominion School, but I didn't have much ex experience or I didn't get to spend time on what I really wanted to do. And at the Royal College of Music, I got the opportunity to work with so many great uh, people and I learned so many things gradually and it was just perfect time for me. So I, d I don't wish to change anything actually, yeah. Great. And, and as you go through your professional life and as you go through life full stop, what does, what does being an alumnus of the Royal College of Music mean to you? Of course, it's, I mean, it's, it's been chosen like the best place to study uh, uh, for, I think, five years consecutively in the UK. And the name, first of all, the name and also the experience that I had working with such great professors. Uh, including yourself at the uh, at uh, the Royal College of Music has given me so much experience and confidence, and it's it it makes me proud when people ask to say that I studied at the Royal College of Music and that I developed everything that I could to become who I am now at, at that place. And um, also, I felt that. Um, I've seen so many universities and colleges around the world and just generally, apart from all the musical qualities of Royal College, it was just such a nice atmosphere for me, you know, including like being right in front of the Albert Hall or the Hyde Park being uh, just across the road and um, people and the, of course, the building itself is just so in inspiring and beautiful. And uh, it was just, really great experience for me. So I'm really like happy uh, that I've studied in the Royal College of Music. And, and you, you alluded to the fact that we're, we're living in strange times at the moment and, and difficult times, let, let's sort of admit it, even if it's just in, in the short term. But um, if, we can, if we can shed some optimistic light on it, perhaps, what has been the most fulfilling experience that you have had since March? 20. Since March, I mean, I, I like the project that I've talk, told you about that um, in, um, in the New York with my uh, with the concert artists, we decided to start on a new project where I would try to bring in my own culture and uh, introduce it to the people in the West and um, to buy just mixing some traditional Middle Eastern instruments into the classical works, arranging them and mixing them with my repertoire for the future recitals. But when it got stopped 
because of the pandemic in March, um, I decided to do to use the time I had, which was endless, to put that into digital platforms and record for social media, which I had great response actually. I got a really, re as you know, at the moment, social media is so important for, for a musician. And um, I've gotten really, like I had great response for the things I did. So I decided to make an album uh, that I'm doing with Sony for digital platforms. And I started recording everything that we planned for on by just being at home or in a studio with people. Uh, and it's been really useful for me because now I have, since much I had the time to do that because otherwise if I, I, I was traveling or doing concerts I wouldn't be able to do all this and now I have a I, I'm gonna have in a few months a great disc on my hand that I'm really really pleased with so I'm um, in a way with all the bad sides I had this opportunity to work on this and I'm very happy about it great um Jamal it's a it's a real pleasure to talk to you uh I'm sorry we don't have more time but um Wonderful to catch up and uh, and to hear about your projects and uh, we'll definitely look out for your your latest uh, recording. Thank um, you. And uh, hopefully we we see each other in person very soon. Hopefully, Mark. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Emma, thank you so much for joining me today for this uh, conversation. It's great that we could hook up um, virtually. Sadly, not in person, but uh, hopefully it won't be too long. Um, I mean, I know that you're incredibly busy and you have such a, a varied career. And I guess there was some indication of that even when you were at college, uh, um, a violist in, in one of the most successful quartets we've had at college, uh, leading symphony orchestra as a violinist, playing Berio Sequenza in your final recital. Um, were you always this uh, musically curious and diverse or was it something that evolved whilst you were a student? I think that's really interesting. I don't know if I've asked myself that before. I think it's actually something that did start at college, really. Um, when I was at school, I was, obviously I loved the music I was playing, but I didn't necessarily have that kind of drive to be going out and discovering new things and kind of learning new, um, totally new skill sets as well. Um, but at college, the there was just this like whole world that I didn't really know existed <laughs> before I went. Um, and being able to learn with so many different people um, about so many different things just really kind of sparked something. Um, I think my professor had a lot to do that as well. Um, I studied with Daniel Rowland, who uh, is um, just incredible and one of the most creative musicians I think I've, I, I know. Um, and that definitely kind of rubbed off on me and my um, just how I felt about music and um, being a musician as well, just that um, excitement to always be doing something different. And that's something that's like really followed me into the years post-college as well. Um, it's normally not, not quite in a <laughs> pandemic times, but normally no day is the same. And I'm um, doing different things all over the place. So yeah, it's, it did start at college, I think. Was it strange for you? I mean, you, you were in quite a unique position, I think, in, in some respects. Was it strange for you the fact that probably more um, people knew you, first of all, as a viola player rather than the violinist, even though violin was your principal study? <laughs> I didn't actually realise that until I was in maybe fourth year and someone came up to me. I'd been leading the um, symphony orchestra and chorus concert and someone came up to me after the concert and said, I didn't know you played the violin. <laughs> And I, that was really alien to me because the two have been absolutely entwined the whole way through my learning experience. I started playing the viola when I went to Cheatham's at 16. Um, I started playing the viola and I just loved it. And it actually, I found that it really informed my violin playing and my violin playing really informed my, my viola playing. Um, and so they just have always coexisted perfectly happily in my mind and I've never considered myself as either really um so I th yeah it was very confusing when people <laughs> did say that to me um but I do yeah I, I think the two skills are um just so compatible and actually that attitude of being versatile and taking kind of bits from different aspects of your learning and um, compiling them into the musician you want to be 
is a really powerful skill. I mean, I, I think in a way it's, it's uh, when I say old fashioned, I don't, I don't mean out of date, but uh, you know, you look back at some of the great Russian artists, for example, people like Slava, people like Rostropovich, who was just a phenomenal um, pianist as well as, uh, uh, as the cellist that we all know him as. Yeah. So actually that sense of being multi-skilled, I think it's a skill that most people actually have let fall. Um, and I think you've proved in your later career that actually being that flexible, flexible and that versatile is, has to be a good thing. Um, yeah. I mean, some pretty crazy stuff since you left college. Um, I mean, uh, including, I remember seeing you playing uh, um, at London Bridge Station. Yeah. Not, not as a busker, I hate to add, but, uh, <laughs> uh, part of the street orchestra, yeah? Um, what's the, what do you think is the wackiest, craziest thing you've done since, since you left? Oh, that's really hard. I think I did an absolutely crazy education project um, in November 2019 um, with Charlotte Harding, who's also an alumni of college, um, a fabulous composer. Um, and we're both quite passionate about folk music, which is another of these kind of, um, you know, side projects of mine. <laughs> um, and we went out to um, Beijing, Singapore and Malaysia. And in nine days, I think we did 16 workshops, um, both performing for and working with the children to kind of um, encourage a creative attitude um, to music making. It was, um, yeah, the strangest trip. I've never been that jet lagged in my life, <laughs> but um, it was a really, really exciting moment. <laughs> Was that the, the one through the Creative Career Centre? At that it was, yeah. So um, the Creative Career Centre was and still remains actually a massive part of my college experience. Um, they, from the eight, from the very beginning, from when I was in first year, they were helping me with um, biographies and just learning how to um, take those skills that I was um, learning in all other areas of the college and actually turn those into um, professional work. Um, and that is, that's kind of continued on. I'm now four years out of college and I still have contact with them. Um, that it's a really massive asset to the RCM, the Creative Career Centre. Yeah. So if we if we think back to your your college your college time, uh, I mean, there's obviously there's a sort of stream of of activities that uh, uh, that take you from point A to point B. Um, but of course, there are those inspirational, memorable moments within that journey as well. I mean, what, what's what kind of top of your list? Uh, it, oh, it... It's really hard to just pick a few, actually. Um, one of them has to be um, meeting Steve Reich. Um, I led the um, RCM Symphony Orchestra in a performance of his three movements for orchestra. And it was the scariest thing I think I've ever done. I had to count to 37 and I can remember that feeling of just playing <laughs> this motif over and over again and thinking I'd lost count and I trusted myself and I did play it the correct number of times um, but he came on stage after the performance and said to me that that's the best performance he'd ever heard of that piece um, and shook my hand I actually have a picture of me um, shaking his hand and I'm kind of covering my mouth in um, kind of shock and alarm because <laughs> it was just such an exciting moment for me um, I think that's something the RCM orchestral projects do is they give you the time to really get into a piece and get to know it um, inside out um, and the kind of help you get with that as well with the sectionals and the amazing conductors that visit is really um, amazing um, but that's something that has stood me in really good stead um, since college because in once you're in the profession you don't have that luxury of time and so spending those um, you know weeks on focusing in kind of, you know, um, immense detail on these amazing orchestral works. It has set me up to be able to kind of keep pace, as it were, in professional life. Um, how does, I mean, as you travel through your professional life, what does it mean to you? I mean, in a way, not, not, what, not what are the benefits, but in, in yourself, what does it mean to you to be an alumna of the RTM? I think it's quite a um, large part of the musician I am today is that I chose to go to the RCM um, because there's this 
um, you know, there's this amazing focus on your instrumental skills and your first study. But I had my eyes open to so many other kinds of music making while I was there. Um, in particular, I look back to, I think in my second year, there was a, a module on focusing on education and um, teaching the violin at the time. And we also ran a workshop in a school and I absolutely got the bug for education work. Um, and now I, I do work all over the world, really. Um, I teach for the National Children's Orchestra and at various schools and at Cheatham School of Music. But I also um, work with kind of vulnerable individuals and those living with dementia and uh, a whole host of every, everyone from the community. Um, and that is a bug that I caught in that second year module at the RCM. Um, so I think it has really shaped me as a person um, going there and also the people you meet at the RCM are just wonderful <laughs> it's I think you don't quite realize when you arrive and you're kind of stood in that freshers fair in the concert hall what how long you will know these people <laughs> but the connections I made at RCM have um, followed me all the way through and I know they'll follow me for many years to come so it's a really it's a really special place thank you um, one last question, put you on the spot. I've been asking everyone this, so uh, with all of your knowledge and wisdom that you that you have through your professional experience and and all of your years at college, what do you know now that you wish you'd known when you turned up as a first year undergraduate? Oh, that's really hard. Oh gosh, I think that those years are really precious. Um, since I've graduated, uh, obviously I still practice and I still make time for keeping my core skills um, where they are. But actually those four years of my undergraduate were where I really learned to play the violin. Um, and I, I really miss those practice rooms. <laughs> I really miss uh, that supportive environment and just being able to you know knock on the door and say oh do you mind listening to this movement um to one of my friends and that was a really that's where I learned to play the violin in those four years um, and so it's a really precious time and you have to use it really wisely I think that's what I wish I'd told myself from day one <laughs> <laughs> the question is would you have listened to yourself though <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a totally different one <laughs> Great, Emma. It's uh, it's such a pleasure to talk uh, talk to you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for, for finding the time. Um, I have to say that um, you know you're such a great ambassador for the college as well. Um, not overtly in what you say, but actually much more in in just the way that you are as an artist and, and a musician. And I think uh, you know without sparing your blushes, um, I, I think if I can, if I would like to try and define how I would like an RCM student to be when they when they move into the professional world and become a fully fledged artist and you're the epitome of that so very much for, for uh, keeping in touch with us and as you say I'm sure our wonderful uh, musical relationship will go on for many years to come. Thanks Emma, thanks. No, thank Bye -bye. you. Bye -bye. Uh, Alina, thank you so much for uh, finding the time to talk with me today. It's a, it's a great pleasure to, to, to have a conversation and to catch up. Uh, so thank you. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit of, about you and your career first, I think, because it, I think it's a very interesting professional profile. Uh, but I think one that you've very consciously developed in a, in a certain way. Um, tell me, at, at what stage do you think in your development did, did you start to make personal choices about repertoire and the kind of music you would be playing? Uh, I suppose that uh, started off quite early. I um, I was already, at, when I was at school, I was already quite experimentative. I, 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 I wanted to, I don't know, do things slightly differently. I was um, uh, approaching music in a possibly in a slightly different way to how um, how I saw people do it around me. And, and um, yeah, so so all of that started early, but I uh, I have to say that I, it's 
very much thanks to the support I had around me that that I yeah that I felt I could do that. I mean, you come from I, I guess something that's very unapologetically a, a, a Russian school of of violin playing. Certainly, that was your your teaching at the beginning. Um, as you've developed, how important is it that sort of pedigree that foundation to, to the beginnings of your playing? Uh, it's very important. And I think I, it's a kind of inbuilt discipline that you have to uh, be completely honest with yourself and not compromise and, and you know, just do, do the work and take it step by step and be very, uh, yeah, very conscientious, conscientious about um, everything you do. Uh, so that, that sticks with you forever. Um, but then of course, they're all different, different styles, different roots, different knowledges you can have about, uh, about music, about life, art, everything, um, which is, I think, uh, completely vital. And and it's, um, yeah, and I think uh, actually being in London and growing up in London since I was 10, it's it's been great in that sense. It, it, there was so much diversity and, and so many different um, different ways to go. And, and, and everywhere you went, you felt welcome. I felt welcome. Mm. I mean, even even when we first met, I, I think there was the already the the first steps in a, a professional career and one that was was looking at really as if it would develop into something very very interesting. Uh, and and yet you chose to go to conservatoire. I guess that you know you didn't have to at that stage. Can you remember what your thoughts were? And and was there ever the temptation to think? actually I'm already beginning to get the concerts I'm already beginning to do the kind of work I want to do do I do I really need to to study within an institution mm. uh, yes I, I did uh, I did have some work I had an agent since I was 16 uh, and there were things happening already but somehow that that was never that was always separate, getting better at something and finding out, you know, finding out what there is and learning uh, uh, from incredible musicians was uh, definitely had to happen. Almost the concerts were optional. Concerts can happen later. You know, there, there's, uh, if, if you turn one down now, chances are it will come back uh, someday. So, uh, but this kind of, uh, but, uh, the opportunity to meet incredible musicians, to play chamber music, to play an orchestra with, you know, I, I, I was lucky to play with Bernard Haitink when I was at college, you know, I, I, how many, how many opportunities like that would I have had, had I not went, you know, um, for me, it was very important to have all that, but I, what I needed at the time, um, more than anything was, uh, that, but also flexibility. So if I did need to go somewhere, uh, that I would be supported and and um, given the opportunity to do that, which I found so uh, so much with you and with college that that I, I absolutely had um, encouragement in every way um, to make that happen. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm recently, I guess, more and more, you're you're developing the the, the teaching. I know that the, the the college students are gaining so much from you, the work that you do with them, both one to one and in a in a masterclass situation. Um, how do you feel that is feeding into your sort of more holistic sense of yourself and your work? Um, well, I I love I'm loving teaching. Uh, I. I love recognizing myself a little bit in the students. You know, I, I, I remember that feeling. I remember, you know, being, uh, being a bit scared of the future, uh, being uh, inspired, but also you don't know what's gonna happen next. This, there is this feeling of uncertainty and am I really, is this really right what I'm doing or, or you know? Um, and that's kind of nice to see and, and uh, nice to, to find out what, how to help. And, and everyone is so different and everyone needs such a different approach and you have to be so uh, sensitive and um, yeah, to try to really be in their skin, you know? Um, so that's been amazing. That's something I'm learning a lot from as well, just to, um, yeah, how, how to let someone open up as much as possible. 
what what they need for that. You've, I mean, already you have such a broad spectrum of activities. So, you know, the the, the quartet, uh, the exploration of of new repertoire as well at, at the other end of the spectrum, if you like, um, both in terms of scale and in terms of of a history. Um, what what is next on your on your voyage of exploration? What what have you yet to do that you would like to to, like to experience? Mm. Well, there, there, there's always more music. There is exciting contemporary music written all the time. Um, uh, yeah, lots of projects. I would love to play more Haydn quartets with my quartet. You know, there are so many, and uh, I don't know. My dream is to record all of them one day. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, the same. I'm, I mean, I'm very happy doing doing what I'm doing. I, I, I guess with lockdowns, I'll. I'm going to come up with more projects to record, to to learn music I wouldn't usually play, and um, I recorded Paganini caprices. Uh, uh, so yeah, things like this, um, something um, something I wouldn't usually do. I think that's that's what we're all doing at the moment, right? <laughs> we're trying to find uh, all those things we can do that we don't do in our usual life. So I was I was going to ask you about that actually because you know so many of uh, of our colleagues and our peers. Um, uh, seem to be uh, pushing more and more out on, on online, and uh, and sometimes one suspects whether they're doing it for themselves or for other people, perhaps more for themselves. But perhaps that's inevitable at the moment. So I, I was wondering, you mentioned the Paganini, but but what kind of projects, or perhaps what's given you the most artistic fulfilment over the last ten months that you've done during lockdown? Uh, well, frankly, any opportunity to play just feels uh, like such a release. Uh, uh, and it, as you say, yes, yes, of course, we, we all need live music. We need to hear live music, but musicians, we, we need to make it as well. It's, it becomes a need, you know, you spend your, your life from the age of whatever, four or five practicing every day and it becomes, it becomes your life. It becomes a way of expression and, and, uh, we have communication with people on a different level and uh, you know the words can never really reach that kind of communication so um uh yeah it's a need <laughs> so i suppose uh yes I, i'm finding i'm finding different kinds of music because i have the time you know usually in my schedule i don't have time to practice Paganini caprices for however long it takes 10 hours a day you know uh so uh so it's been nice to be able to do that um uh, but yeah, I, I don't know yet what I'm going to do next. I'm thinking maybe some Baroque music or, I don't know. Hmm. Um, one last question, I guess, uh, which is that if you if you turn the clock back and think of yourself as a, as a young undergraduate at, at the RCM, um, is there something that you know now that you wish you'd known then? Um... I, I think I would tell myself that uh, that everything is fine and and it'll it'll work out. You know, I, I would try and try and release some of that kind of anxiety and fear. You know, um, I don't know if that's possible even because uh, mm -hmm. yeah, because it's a scary time. Um, but but generally, I I. I was very happy. I think I, I made the most of my time mm -hmm. at college. I, I really, um, I, I felt I gained a lot. No, I would agree. You made the most of your time. I mean, <laughs> they, they always say that if you want something done, then you give it to a busy person to do, and, and that was certainly certainly the case with you. It was mm -hmm. a, it was a pleasure having you there as a student, and it's a pleasure having you as a as a colleague now at at. at college. Thank you. Alina, thank you so much for taking the time today to, to talk to me. Uh, it's wonderful to catch up, and I hope that we will have the chance to meet in person very soon. Me too. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Bye-bye. Good afternoon, Eche Quartet. It's uh, great that you could find the time to talk to me today. Um, I'm very much looking forward to our conversation ab about you, your, your quartet, but also 
actually chamber music in in general um it's a of course a key part of uh, of, of uh, our activities in the string faculty um we actually have three quartets associated with college uh, we have yourselves as the fellowship quartet uh, we have the harlem quartet who are our visiting quartet a uh, wonderful group from New York and, of course, the Ciccone Quartet, who've been with us uh, for many years now as Quartet in Association. And before then, they were they were students at the RCM and indeed formed there as well. Um, but let's turn to you, Echeas. Uh, great that uh, you could join us on this programme starting last September as the Junior Fellowship Quartet. I know that you've only had a, a fleeting opportunity really to, to get to know the college just a couple of months and, and of course some of those in some way affected by by the pandemic as well. Um, but I wonder if you could uh, just uh, say a few to perhaps about your initial impressions about about the college and, and what it's like to be a chamber group within college. Well, so far at the college, we have been incredibly lucky to use the amazing new facilities. We've spent a huge amount of time in the performance hall, um, recording the Death of the Maiden that you'll see is from the new performance hall and we have just absolutely loved using that space as well as other spaces in the college. We've also been working extensively with um, college faculty, particularly Simon Roland Jones, who has been a mentor of ours for slightly over a year, but because of college we have been able to work in more depth with him, especially on the Haydn String Quartets, which he edited. Repeaters. Uh, great, thank you very much. I, mean, I know you you went up to Norfolk to spend some intensive time with Simon in in the autumn. As as a as a group who already know each other well, you're established. You you have a good working routine. What does that kind of intensive work with somebody like Simon? What does it mean, and and how do you feel transformed by that experience? I think having Simon's input, particularly on two Haydn quartets that we managed to get through in about the space of a month, meant that we were very much equipped with a certain set of tools in terms of analytically how we look at the score um, and also always in comparison with other previous manuscripts and previous editors who, who you know, through the, through the, particularly through the 19th century, such as Hummel, made a, a vast um, imprint and an impression on performance practice at the time. So having sort of three aspects to it, how we're trying to perform it now in the 21st century really, really gave us a, um, a sort of eye-opening aspect on, on, the, on the new quartets. When you work with somebody like Simon, I mean, I suppose this is applicable to us as, as uh, individual performers, as well as part of a group, but, you know, obviously he has a very particular perspective uh, and a vast knowledge. Do you find, that your stylistic opinions are are changed are they shaped i mean how much do you must you played haydn before with a sense of your own style so i guess it's always that that balance isn't it between um being adaptable when somebody gives you a different perspective but but maintaining if you like your own integrity your own musical voice as well Um, I felt like Simon was um, very good at honouring what we were doing if it was working. However, if it wasn't working, he would like give us a few options for us to try. So he was quite, uh, I think it was quite a nice balance of his opinions and also ours. I mean, this is a, I guess this is a personal question a little bit about how you guys work together. But, you know, I, I see quartets who are who are hungry for every coaching opportunity they, they can have. Um, but the problem is often they it feels that they're being pulled and pushed from one person's perspective to another person's perspective without perhaps the time to uh, to really. Uh, integrate it or to, to consider it. Um, and then, of course, other groups really strike out alone. Um, but then, of course, they don't have the benefit of somebody else's knowledge and perspective. I was just wondering, for, uh, within the way that you work, where would you see yourself in that spectrum? It's interesting because that has 
shifted in our time together. When we first formed, we were bouncing from coaching to coaching. Um, I think often we had up to six coachings a week. And it was very useful initially, but now it's a very active conversation between us when we are prepared for input and also um, rehearsing after a coaching and um, coming to terms with what works and what is true to our voice and our musical perspective, um, as well as uh, trying to make the most of really valuable op opinions external to what the four of us will discuss. Of course, also in a quartet, um, there are four of us, so we also will disagree. And But I think often the most interesting creative decisions come from conflict and come from discussions. And that's something that I think is so important to remember whenever you are having arguments about the music as those are the most interesting and valuable arguments to have. Uh, thank you. I mean, in, in a way, I'm, I'm going to put you all on the spot here in turn. Um, I mean, there is no, I guess there's no right or wrong answer to this one. But uh, I, I guess as much as is it, it's important when you're an individual player that you learn how to practice. I think as a, as a quartet, you succeed or any chamber group, you succeed or fail by your ability to rehearse properly and rehearse constructively. I mean, if you were to put into one or two sentences uh, a sort of golden rule about rehearsing in, in a chamber group, uh, what would each of you say that was? I actually have one which um, we established quite early on, and I think Alieta said once to us after um, myself and the previous second violinist came to a head about a Haydn phrasing was that um, no one is wrong and everyone is right. And that kind of <laughs> kind of works, I guess, in, in, in both directions. Um, yeah. So essentially, I guess there are, there are no invalid ways of viewing how a phrase or, or a piece of music may or may not go. I, I would say... That's... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, don't strangle it, let it breathe. If that makes sense. I think that's what's interesting about chamber music, though, is that you can you work with three different people with three different opinions of, or, or voices. And I think it's really interesting to see all the different voices, how everyone feels a phrase should be and and then working a way to to do that together I think that's what's what makes chamber music really interesting the conflicts and the decision making and the ways things change as well I feel like in a way we're all kind of saying we're, we're saying things along the same lines other than Dave's point which is really, really valuable and very, a very important thing for us to remember because we can really get bogged down. Um, but one perspective on this issue that actually the ex-cellist of the Harlem Quartet talked to us about Paul Wianco when we were doing a residency at Banff. He said that the only quartet he knows that, um, uh, that get along perfectly well are the Jack Quartet because whenever they have a, a creative conflict, they can just ask the composer. There's always someone external with an answer. Um, and that's very unique for a quartet. There are very few quartets that always have a ready solution to any conflict that comes up. And that there's so many quartets who will take different planes. You hear all of these stories about dram like such dramatic relationships between members. Um, but he said that the thing to always remember is that comes from a love and a passion for music. And so I think for me, one of the most important things to remember in chamber music is that um, if we are having those, those conflicts, that those creative conflicts come from love and from passion. And that's what makes them so important and so interesting. Great, thank you very much. Um, I, I would add something in there as well, which is a, it's a very pragmatic and a practical thing, but it's very hard for all of us to do, which is, don't talk, just play. Uh, I've yet met, yet to meet a group who have that balance right. And that probably included the two professional quartets that I played with the whole of my life. 
uh, we were getting there with the second group where we would just play through a movement and then without talking, we would play through the movement again, because actually that way you sort out 90% of the things that you would have spent hours talking about anyway. Um, and that, you know, uh, music is, is more eloquent than words. So if you use your ears and you play, then you are going to resolve most of your issues anyway, I think. Um, great. Okay. So, uh, obviously we, we didn't manage to fulfill all of, all of your plans, uh, for the beginning of your fellowship at college because of the, of the pandemic. Um, I'm delighted that we're going to be offering you a second year so that we can actually, you can have a little bit more time in the building and we can really see through, uh, to fruition, uh, some of your artistic ideas. Um, all things being equal, uh, what do you have in the pipeline? What would you what would you like to develop in the college in the coming months? Um, I suppose one of the, the hardest things about getting into chamber music is just the contact and being kind of paired together with people and finding people that suit you and your, your musical needs. So one thing that we've discussed is running a kind of chamber music evening soiree where gives the opportunity for people to meet their cohort, but also to play with us um, and to ultimately find people that they can start something from the ground up. Um, yeah. And other things too. Great, thank you very much. Um, so we've been in strange times for the last, uh, for the last 10 months. <clears throat> I guess in some ways, uh, chamber groups are in a way, a, a very interesting aspect of what one might do within a within a, a, a pandemic situation where one can't travel so much, where where there's social distancing. I guess if you're a you know if you're a concerto soloist uh, and touring the world, then then your career really has been radically changed, and there's not much you can do apart from sit on the sidelines. But tell me, how have you guys been passing the last the last ten months and Perhaps what have you developed or what are you thinking about <clears throat> developing that you wouldn't have otherwise? Oh. Oh. Up to you, Alieta. Oh. <laughs> um, we've been, well, we've been together, um, I think since June, we've been rehearsing um, since we were able to to meet, so um, we were able to we were able to meet and organize our own concerts within the smaller um, outside concerts and um, around London. Um, sorry, can you repeat the question again? I completely. <laughs> Sure, I was I was just asking that you know because obviously a lot of our, the way that we perform has has had to change necessarily, and yeah. I was wondering first of all how you you spent the time, but also uh, in a way what you might have thought about developing because of the current situation that perhaps you wouldn't have done if we if life had just carried on as it was before. Oh, well, we've had so much, so much more time to to think about the music and to study the music in so much more depth than us than usual when we when like a normal um, schedule gets fills up so quickly with traveling and concerts and and things in day to day life. But having the time has actually been a blessing because we've been able to really focus in and and really go into that depth that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise. And that's just been amazing for us at this stage. If, if things go back to normal, whatever normal is <laughs> um, for a performing musician, but um, do you think we should go back to the way that we were doing things before? Or do, do you actually think that there are some things that we have thought, thought about that we might do better than we did before or differently to how we did it before. Yeah, I actually, I think that's so interesting because I think the pandemic has kind of forced us to think about the nature of the concert hall and the nature of a programme 
as we know it, um, conventionally starting at 7.30 p.m. with an interval, two halves um, with, you know, three quartets, usually particularly for a quartet concert. And I think that because of the nature of social distancing and perhaps concerts being only an hour long and happening over a court, you know, multiple concerts over a course of the day, I think we are very much encouraged now to be more adventurous with how we program and maybe perhaps you know starting a concert with a Haydn quartet isn't where we're, isn't the direction we're headed with and we can seek the value of it as you know light relief at the end or yeah and just be get clever with how we program I think is valuable uh I mean I think for me actually one of the one of the most important elements of this is of course you know there was this rush to put everything online which let's face it just in very sort of uh, kind of uh, Im immediate terms is, is a compromise because we don't get sound, we don't get the quality, we don't get the nuance. Um, but actually, of course, it, it also uh, doesn't really get to the heart of what experiencing live music is, which is this very uh, immediate uh, and sensory reaction to being in a place where something is happening uh, at that moment in time. So, I mean, I think in a way what the absence of the possibility of live music uh, perhaps made us realize is when we could go back in the autumn to listening music really being played for us in that space is that it's such a personal medium, um, you know, and it's one that if we could find a distillation of that way that we can reach an audience directly then you know th then i think we're we're really onto something and and as you mentioned uh, before we started this chat you know this uh, actually chamber music is perhaps one of the best uh, of all of the of, the, of the, the possibilities where we can both do small scale concerts we can repeat concerts we can be flexible with programming but we can actually be more direct with our audience as well in the way that we present present concerts and uh, and contextualize concerts as well um so yeah i mean i in a way i think chamber musicians and particularly chamber musicians of your generation and students who are who are going through now they have so many possibilities uh, uh, available um, to, to really find a, a new way of doing things. Because, you know, I mean, the audiences are still there craving for, for, for to listen to music and the artists are still there craving to perform it. So even if the conventional ways of joining A to B are no longer so practical, you know, we just need to find different ways to do it. And, and perhaps it was high time that that, that kind of happened anyway. Um, certainly in the area of, of chamber music, I think it was often seen as a, as a sort of niche area, even within classical music, which is seen as a, a, a sort of niche area in itself, when you step outside of the, of the sort of the ivory tower of, of those of us practitioners who are doing it. Um, I don't know if you, uh, I'm going to put you again on the spot here, I suppose. If you somebody said to you, OK, you have 60 minute recital um, and you're going to be doing it in a in a place, in a space that is not a conventional performance space. Kind of what what immediately springs to mind? Forest with microphones and speakers. That was what immediately springs to my mind. OK, and, and sort of repertoire and, and how would you present it? Um, well, I guess people could scatter themselves around and there's a lot of uh, space in a forest and you could have several speakers like all around, like a big surround sound kind of thing. And I'd need a budget, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and repertoire mm, for forest, don't have to think. Maybe like Shimonovsky stuff which is you know quite mystical and with nature i don't know i think most i think chamber music is a lot of it is with nature anyway i guess anything could work <laughs> uh, obviously not um a winter concert this one uh, maybe spring or summer yeah <laughs> um great i mean I, I i think there are so many possibilities and, uh, and of course actually um I think what audiences will be looking for 
in the future is, I mean, it's partly packaging, I suppose, but actually I think what they'll be looking for is integrity as well. Artists who really have something to say. So um, how, in a way, the, the way that we present is needs to be fundamentally connected with what we have to say and and what you know in, in going even further i guess perhaps what our social responsibilities are as artists perhaps that's a, a kind of quite a, a, a it's a concept that's perhaps hard to get hold of but perhaps one of the things that we've learned in pandemic is that the arts have a, a real social function and artists have a real social responsibility um, rather than it just being there purely for for entertainment, um, I don't know. Do you see you? Do you see yourself as having social responsibility? In, in I mean, over and beyond education work and things like that, your your role within society. Absolutely, I think as as artists, we absolutely have a social responsibility. And in terms of the artistic integrity that you mentioned, Mark, I'm thinking back to your previous question as well about what we learned in our time not being able to perform um, and having our roles as artists shifted and our creative outlets shifted. Um, and I think um, as performers, it's very easy to become anesthetized to the experience of performing. And um, I have one memory in specific I'm thinking of of when the quartet went on a tour in North America and we played about 26 concerts in a month and we got back and we performed um, the same program that we had been performing on that tour and one of our main mentors John Myersko said to us like you're absolutely saying nothing like the music you're not the, the harmonies mean nothing to you you've completely lost track of your cre your creative voice and your integrity as a group um, and so I think that in, in terms of what we've learned in the pandemic and relate, like relating to that, um, the voice of us as artists, I think it's, it's been a time to really focus on that because we're not, we're not getting on stage. And when we do get on stage, one, the only time, the very few times that we've got, gotten, gone on stage in the past year, it's been terrifying. And it's meant something very, very different than what it used to mean when you just, um, we actually have, a, there's a joke Eliza always um, used to tell about us um, performing where she'd say, oh, you know, we wheel it out and then we wheel it back in, you know, and it, it does start to feel like that when you're performing, you know, constantly. Um, so I hope that moving forward, we'll be thinking about that integrity, both artistically, but also in our programming. That's something that is very, very, very important to us and something that we are trying to think about increasingly because it's not good enough anymore to only program white men. It's not, it's not good enough. And um, in the summer, we started to think more about um, what the balance of our programming looks like. And it's very difficult when you're going for competitions and all of the repertoire that is on those lists is Brahms and Beethoven. And of course it is, and that's fantastic music that we absolutely love to play. Um, but that's I, something that I think I would love to see competitions change as well. And that needs to kind of change on, on a lot of, for a lot of people and with a lot of organizations, if there's gonna be a shift. Uh, I mean, I think we don't have time to talk about competitions because for me, the, the cha changing uh, music into an Olympic sport is, is, is very strange anyway. But I think certainly artistic programming and even, you know, uh, artistic development should, should really never be shaped or driven by competitions, certainly. Um, I've got my eye on the time and we're, we're almost out of time. It's, it's uh, lovely to talk to you guys, uh, really. Um, hopefully when, when this is uh, over and we can get together in the same room, uh, there will be many more discussions like this and, and uh, other aspects of chamber music playing and, and repertoire and programming. Um, as I said before, it's, it's wonderful that you will be with us now at the college for a, another 18 months. Um, so thank you for your time today. Uh, anybody uh, watching this recording, stay around because we now have a, a wonderful performance of the first movement of uh, Schubert's Death and the Maiden Quartet. 
which was recorded in October in one of our new performance spaces in the Performance Hall. Uh, but for now, Eche Quartet, uh, thank you so much for talking with me today, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Bye bye.
Being at the RCM has been a wonderful privilege. When I first got here in September, I was sort of getting to know London a little bit and I've, I've loved living in London. And I think the most significant thing is to have the opportunity to play for so many amazing musicians. I came to the Royal College of Music because I studied with my teacher Thomas Carroll at the Yehuda Menun School. 
and I thought it would be the best for me to continue my studies with him at the Royal College of Music. I had amazing opportunities to play with the RCM Classical, the Philharmonic and the Symphony Orchestras and also I had the wonderful experience to play with uh, the great Nicola Benedetti in a quartet. We had a workshop and it was a fantastic experience. What makes the string faculty one of the best places to study for a string student is the fact partly that we have wonderful professors here, some of the best in the world. But of course, the experience of the one-to-one -one lesson has to be supported by a whole range of activities and those other activities we're well known for, for what we do and the success of what we do. There are many different opportunities that you can take part in. There are lots of orchestra projects and chamber music, so it's, it's really exciting. I think one thing that we have done very well at the Royal College of Music is create musicians who are the innovators for the future. So we're not just reacting to a workplace that is already there, but we're creating artists and musicians who will shape the nature of, of music and, and how that will interact with society in the future. They will be the next generation of the world's leading artists. It's the perfect place for any musician to be able to develop and become the best musician they want to be in the future and they listen to us then they help us with everything that we want to do. So I, I couldn't have imagined a better place to study. Being at the ASEAN, having the student atmosphere here, everyone is so supportive of each other. It's just a really nice culture here.
We are really excited to be here. Uh, uh, we came from New York and we love London. It's one of these top cities you think of when you dream of going somewhere. But even more so because we will be working with uh, wonderful students and uh, prestigious uh, organizations such as the Royal College of Music. Uh, we are thrilled. Couldn't be more excited. We're excited to be here for a week working at the Royal College and getting to hear the wonderful, talented students that are here and work with the faculty and also get to perform concerts. Well, as a violist, this is my first time here in the Royal College and I think this is a two-way road of uh, learning from uh, myself to the student and from the students to me too. So I'm actually looking forward to share all this experience. Working together with the students works two ways for us and it's actually amazing because we learn as much from them as hopefully they learn from us. But the takeaway is always fun because we get to think about describing things that we work on daily in different ways and we also get feedback from them so we have a lot of creative ideas that we can then incorporate into our music making and rehearsals and concerts. I can breathe art in this building, you know. You look outside and there's the, an amazing hall there and something around that you, you can feel that you can breathe music. Hopefully the students will be able to take home with them uh, the various things that we talk with them about over the course of this week and in future visits, uh, both technically speaking as well as musically. And most of all, just we really want to pass on the joy of music making to them. My name is Maxi Vengerov and I'm a violinist and conductor. Today we have uh, three students playing violin concerto of Beethoven. Three movements, three students. So everything is uh, First of all, free? we are meeting in the room one-on-one uh, -on -one together with the pianist, imagining there is an orchestra behind. So I'm preparing them for the next step, which is an orchestral rehearsal. Hi, I'm Roberto Ruisi and I'm one of the soloists in the Vengeroff Masterclass tonight. Roberto is a wonderful violinist who has uh, close to perfect intonation, uh, very good musical ideas and he's very experienced as a player. Uh, he looks, at least on the outside, as a very confident player, uh, very communicative. Yet, I know what we're going to talk about uh, to tonight and I'm not going to give it away. <laughs> Ah, you see, the bow changes, yeah? So by Such a detailed okay, lesson you know, that talks about connecting. kind of the more uh, philosophical side of, yeah, of Beethoven and playing Beethoven. Finally, you see the light in the end of the darkness, huh? of the dark tunnel, yeah? And I... It's like the stairs to heaven. That's what he spoke is, yeah. in well, great detail here, about yeah. how this concerto can transcend you to heaven, but is also at the same time very earthy. This is the best way to explore this repertoire without so much risk and with joy and pleasure and to get to know the cornerstones and where the uh, sharks and dangers are. After you've learned all the challenges and solutions in the, with the orchestra, you know it all, then you should let go. Yeah, so, and that we'll explore, of course, uh, tomorrow. <laughs> Hello, my name's Mark Messenger and I'm Head of Strings at the Royal College of Music. 
every student has different needs and they respond differently and in different ways. And I suppose one of the, uh, the magic tricks of a great teacher is that they understand that very quickly. They understand the psychology of the student, they, un they understand what they need. I think he finds what is strong in you as a violinist and then exaggerates that um, and brings it out in its best way. I think he knows with a player straight away whether they have some fire in them, whether they have, when they really want to make music. And I think that one of the best things is that every single inch of his, his body and his body language is focused around inspiring you to do as much as you can. Maria is a very sensitive uh, girl who plays the second movement and she's, uh, her tone is beautiful and she's, uh, she can melt in the musical material. She, she's so adaptable and she's so flexible. She is meticulous in her preparation. Uh, she thinks about everything. She thinks about every note, how every note should be played, how every note should sound. It was amazing to work with, with Maxim Bengerov and he's one of the big legends of the violin and the music as well. It's like the magnet. Exactly. What's wonderful with Maxim is that he is not at all dogmatic in his musical views, but he has such a wealth of wisdom and knowledge and experience that, of course, everything he says is valuable and everything he says is pertinent. Um, but I think actually great artists are, in their souls, they are humble people who understand that, that every point of view can be the correct one and and we can learn from everybody. The main feeling I got from him is a uh, human feeling. We, we look up to these uh, musicians, these artists, and we feel like they're up there and and it's something we really want to achieve, you know, to be able to speak our in our own words uh, this music. And he was he was just a human being who was telling his story. And of course there is so much to learn from him. The temptation is to take the violin and to learn the notes and explore the musical material in depth and what can I say with this music, how can I adapt this music to myself, how can I shine and how can I express my emotions using the music. You're still ta -ra -ra -ra. You learn. Can horns vibrate so much? Details that relate to the orchestration, to the instruments that are playing in the different themes in the concert, in my movement, for instance. Uh, there is a lot of woodwinds, the horns, then the strings, and how that uh, interacts with me and uh, how I interact with them as well, how I pass the melody from one to another or from them to me and so on. The chemistry between the student and the teacher is it's always in a state of flux and it always has to have the possibility of traveling both directions. Uh, yeah, tomorrow is the concert and uh, I'm very excited actually because I haven't played much with orchestra and not with Wenger of conducting, that's, that's amazing. Hello, my name is Lynn Faber and I'm from Luxembourg. I think she's so elegant with her instrument. She has um, an incredible intellectual grasp of what she's doing.
you have to distinguish between all the characters that are in music, yeah? And you have to study them separately. He has a very deep knowledge of this music and he really transmits that and he shows us how important it is to um, know all the different elements in this music and to characterize it well and to really communicate later on with the orchestra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't need to slow down. I think this preparation and the journey that we're going through uh, it's also a great discovery to me. I played the Beethoven Violin Concerto definitely more than 300 or 400 times in my life. But uh, each time I'm coming back to this uh, piece, uh, it's as if this is a world premiere. Yeah, the typical, typical, you know, elements of hunting. Yeah, has this element. It can be scary um, because, yeah, it's a person that has so much charisma and such a big career, and we all admire him for that. So, in that sense, it can be scary, but also inspirational because of the, the same reasons. I think what the soloists get from this experience is both short-term, medium-term, long-term. In the short-term, they get something very immediate which helps them play and helps them perceive and helps them feel this piece in a way that makes more sense, is more coherent, is more cohesive, is more secure, is more assured. In the medium-term, there are elements both of how they develop as performers and, and how they perceive this piece, which, which give them confidence and it grows inside them. So the next time they play it, they're building on an accumulation of, of, of experience. All my life I've been studying and immediately I wanted to share what I've learned with others. I think this sharing an opportunity to share with others is the greatest joy of my life. I don't even call it teaching because almost when you share, when you give a gift to the audience or to uh, advice to students, this is, you know, of course you're giving a gift, but we are so fortunate that we can give a gift. The end of the fairy tale. <laughs> I think tonight when they've finished and they've done their concerto and, and the audience have applauded and we pack up and go, of course, what will remain with them in that one moment tonight will be excitement, will be satisfaction, will be a, almost a sense of kind of enlightenment and revelation. It's almost a rite of passage as well. Masterclasses, are they worth it? Of definitely, course, definitely. Yeah, we learn so much definitely, from it, yeah, yeah. and especially in these kind of settings because it's so unusual. And yeah. It really opens our playing, and yeah, we react to, we react yeah. quicker as well, and yeah, it's more pressure, but in a way it helps. To oh, improve. definitely, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. What now? A drink? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
to be a fantastic festival, and to start it off actually was a yeah. real treat because everyone was there for a great for a day of the time, and then to be able to meet and be on the summer starting. Yeah. It's really exciting. I think it's been an absolutely fantastic day, so full of energy and a really lovely, very programme with solo, duo, quartet and ensemble and everything in between. Really full of energy, wonderful programme, moving from one place to another, so keeping us all on our, on our toes. Fantastic day and thank you very much for, to the Royal College. Brilliant.
Nikki, thank you so much. And um, I guess my first question, seeing you are here in your teaching capacity, is that um, you're, you're such a wonderful communicator when you play the violin, and such an amazing communicator when you, when you teach as well. Um, I think it was Rubinstein who said that it's very rare that he meets a student who is so bad that he can't learn something from them. Right. What, um, what do you get from the teaching experience? Oh, no, absolutely. I was actually just thinking that. That's why I'm <laughs> nodding as you're talking. I was just thinking how much I learned from listening to those three violinists. Um, everybody always has... Well, we're, we're all... It's just like you learn from people in everyday mm -hmm. life. Everyone's got something to offer, has something to say, something you can, you can take from and learn from. And um, I think people have very different ways of, of interpreting pieces of music, they have different ways of, of managing the, the roller coaster of playing the violin. And it's such a personal thing and um, such an individual thing that you can always learn from, from every, every player you come across. I definitely did today. Um, but I mean, other than that, I think you, I just feel a, a necessity. If you've been granted and privileged enough to receive a lot of information in your life, which, which I have through all my violin teachers and all the musicians that I've come across and that I've had the pleasure of getting to know, um, I just I feel it's the, the most natural thing in the world to try to, to pass that on as, as best you can, try to, to share what, what you've been told. It, it's a difficult balance, isn't it? Because we want to impart information and yet we don't. We, we don't want to impose a point of view. I, the whole time, yeah, through, the, through this masterclass, I'm just constantly thinking, well, I could say another way of doing it, but actually your way of doing it is fine, and that's, <laughs> that's okay. There are many ways of doing things. You're constantly trying to make those decisions as, as a, well, I, I wouldn't call myself a, a teacher, but if, if, you're, if you are teaching, you're constantly trying to weigh up the pros and cons of interfering with someone's natural way of doing something. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very difficult decision to, to make in that moment, and you're trying to be as, as, as sensitive as possible, but at the same time, people are taking part in the masterclass, they're having lessons because they want to know what you have to say. Some of the time. <laughs> Sometimes you get a look like, no, I just don't agree with that. So <laughs> at which point I just move on to the next, the next, uh, the next phrase or the next point. But um, I, I, I think I'm, I'm constantly asking myself that question. How, how, much do you, how much do you interfere and how much do you just try to, to work on people's strengths and the, and the voice that they, they, always ha they already have? I think recognizing and accepting and liking the things that make someone different to you and the things that are individual to them, their characteristics and intricacies of how they, they play their instrument, I think that's, that's really a life lesson anyway. You know, you, we don't have to agree on everything for me to like you or for me to get along with you. And I think I, I, I feel that when I'm working with musicians and I feel that when I'm teaching um, exactly the, 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 the same sensation. It's just you, you're, you're opening your eyes to a different way of, of doing something. Mm -hmm. Do you... Well, we are all students forever, I guess, but right. did, when, when you were learning to play the violin, do you, did you have somebody who was particularly inspirational in your life? All of my teachers, each mm -hmm. and every one of them. I started with Brenda Smith mm -hmm. in Ayrshire in Scotland. I, I did Suzuki Methods. That was from the age of four till nine. Um, she was just so enthusiastic, so relentless, I, I admire, I can't, I can't even describe to you how much I admire anyone that, that teaches young children full time. I mean, that is, that is um, an, an instrument like the violin, which is so complicated and so difficult and things can go in directions that you don't intend. And it's, um, it's a very subtle, subtle skill. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm so grateful to, to her for, for uh, she actually had a whole team of, of young, young people ar around her. She, she was really kind of, she infected um, Ayrshire with, with, a, um, with a great enthusiasm for, for violin playing. And then after that, I went to Yehudi Menuhin School. I studied with Natasha Boyarsky there, had five years with her and, and Lucia Ibragimova. They were both unbelievable teachers, a, a very different, um, method. It was very strict, very to the point, very um, 
a lot was, was expected of us. We really had to be prepared, otherwise you, you didn't want to go to that lesson not prepared. Um, and, but I loved that and thrived in that, and I was so appreciative of the, I mean, on a subconscious level, of the pressure that we were put under, because practicing the violin is really not always fun at all, and it's very difficult some of the time, and it's, it can be relentless and quite lonely, and. Uh, monotonous and um, to have to have a mixture of inspiration and pressure I think is it, it, it was the right combination for me after that I, I studied with Maciek Rakowski for another five years um, and I, I would say Maciek really f formed so much of not just my violinistic understanding but really my, my musical understanding he he has such a, a depth of knowledge and love for each and every piece that he he teaches um, Again, there's no amount of detail that will be too much for him to, to pass on to you. And um, you should see some of my scores from the years I was studying with him. They are just blackened with, with, with little scribbles and information that I would try desperately to, to take from him and to remember and to then work into the piece. And, um, and after that, I did study with, with a few other teachers, and, uh, but, but nothing as solid and as, mm -hmm. as kind of consistent as that. You, uh, you mentioned the, the scores when you were studying with Matchek. Uh, uh, how do we kind of cross that boundary then between the absolute detail mm. of learning and practice and the creative spontaneity of performance? Yeah, it's, it's very, very difficult. That's why I was so impressed with all three players today. They just seemed so free on, on stage and, and so able to, to although they're in the middle of studying day in day out, um, so so able to to detach from that, really perform, really be free, and give everything that they they have. Um, I think it is a very difficult transition, not just from that, not just the transition that you go through with every single piece of music, which is one of immense detail of delving into the um, the, the 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 bottom of the the score. You're you're um, trying to overcome all the physical and technical hurdles of playing very difficult music. Uh, there is no question that layers and layers of that very analytical, very um, sort of ground, groundwork has to be done. And it has to be built on slowly. You have to be patient with it. It can't just all be, I'm just going to pour my heart out and be inspired and hope for the best. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and, uh, but, but, yeah, at, at some point you, you have to live in your, in your intention, you have to live in your dream of what you would like this piece to sound like. And actually that's the point where all the many parts of, of the information that you've, you've been given, the hours of practice that you've done, and all of those intricate workings of the piece, um, if you really are kind of living in your in your dreams of what you want this piece to sound like, all of those things just kind of mold together and they melt away. They become really secondary to, to, your, to your vision and the strength of your vision for the piece of music. That's an ideal state anyway. That's where I'm always trying to get to with every piece of music. Um, but it's, it's not easy and it's a huge sort of round circle journey that, that can feel like it goes on forever. And with many pieces of music, you actually find um, that it's, it's never, it's not just an incremental development and improvement. Some days it's, it's getting much better, some days it's, it's, it's weaker. Um, the, the, the improvement can be, can be patchy and, and that can be very difficult on you sometimes. You, you, you feel like you've done your six hours every day for, for the last two weeks. Why is this not just better? Um, and, and sometimes the, the, then it can get better if you put it to bed and you step away from the piece and you come back to it in a month's time when you haven't been practicing that work at all and suddenly everything has just molded together. But that's just the, the, the nature of dealing with with things that are so complex and so wonderful and so incredible and so great, um, sometimes they just take a long time to, to really sink in. I mean, uh, that's, I guess that's um, a, an environment when you play Bach or Isai or in your trio where you can, you can realize your aspirations, your dreams. Mm. <clears throat> How does that play out when you turn up in Spain in a few weeks to do Tchaikovsky and you have, I don't know how many hours if 
probably not many with the orchestra, mm. and then you have to perform. Well, I think, of course, that a lot of spontaneity is re relied on <laughs> um, <laughs> for, for those. I mean, that's what I would say I, I, I do more than any other form of performing is, is concerto performances. So um, it's really the most natural thing in the world for me to meet with the conductor. We have a quick chat about the, the score you have, depending on which country you're in, depending on um, how much time the, the orchestra has to rehearse with you, but sometimes it can be, well, in, in England, like, sometimes it's a, a run through and then you're on stage. Um, sometimes it can, you can have sort of two full rehearsals, but it's interesting to view that process as well. Sometimes with a more rehearsal, things don't necessarily improve. And that's going back to the, the ideal state of interpreting a piece of music and of making music together is one, um, that isn't focused on detail. It's not uh, uh, striving to have control over everything that's happening. It's actually one of complete trust and almost abandonment. You're, you're giving yourself up to the moment and taking anything that comes at you and just doing your best with it, molding it in the direction you want to go in. And that, uh, I think, is something you have to become accustomed to if you're if you're playing with uh, different orchestras and working with different conductors all the time. Um, either that or you become a soloist that is that remains very controlling over exactly how it should go and then I think those soloists tend to work with the same conductors a lot. They develop very uh, deep relationships with, with specific musicians and specific orchestras and they kind of develop a language together. That's also another way of doing it. Um, maybe I'll get there at some point, but <laughs> at the moment I'm sort of going with the flow a little bit more. <laughs> um, I mean, you, you have a busy, busy career and any international soloist is, is practicing, learning, performing on the plane, packing the bag. Um, which is a, a job and a half anyway, mm -hmm. and yet you yes. spend at least the same amount of time, effort, investment of yourself in all of your work with young people and your educational work. Mm. What, what kind of drives you to do that? I think just going back to what I was, I was saying at the beginning, I think it, it's just the most natural thing in the world. I don't really feel like it's an effort or even that it's a thought process I have to mull over. Usually the thought process I have to, to work my way out of is, is how not to overspend my time on, on that because um, playing and playing well and dealing with the pressures of getting up in front of large crowds and um, just playing those difficult concertos in front of people, that, that does take a lot of focus and a lot of concentration. You do have to be protective over your time, otherwise you can get yourself into trouble. Um, but it, yeah, it's just really the most, the most natural thing for me. I, I think I've, I've had enormous privilege in my life to have um, found an instrument that I had an affinity with at a young age, to have had great parents, teachers, encouragement, an amazing um, kind of, system around me in the various parts of my life that enabled me to, to, to improve and, and develop, to develop. And then from the ages of 15, 16, I had, I had opportunities to perform. I mean, lots of people play great and they don't get opportunities to perform. Uh, and it's such a competitive world, it's such a tough world. So I, I have an overwhelming gratitude at all times for all those experiences that I've had. And I think the least I can do is, is, to, is to try to to, to share that feeling that I have um, and also to, to try to n not just to teach people that are already on that path, teach young people that already do play, they already have teachers, they, they, they go to this college, they, they have so much infrastructure around them that allows them to experience classical music. I also like to go to places where nobody's even heard a piece of classical music, not knowingly anyway, um, and, and just try to plant a seed of what it can feel like to get to know a Beethoven symphony or to get to know a Tchaikovsky symphony. And, and when, you, when you've listened to it enough times that you're waiting for certain moments to come and you, you get a feeling of that overarching shape and, and just how amazing that feels, um, if you're so aware of the greatness of that feeling and you're so appreciative of it, you do just naturally want other people to, to sh share in that with you and to experience that with you. I think it's quite, I think that's quite natural. 
but but I mean I guess the investment and time and effort comes of, of course you get the you know you get the the benefit you get the feel good factor when you when you introduce people to music like in that way mm. but the investment of time and effort mm. comes with the obstacles that we face in in getting that to happen um, I mean uh, from what you've said and from what you've written sometimes one feels that actually there's a struggle that there's a fight that's going on to actually enable these things to happen right um it's it's yeah that's a, it's a difficult it's a difficult subject altogether on the one hand um i mean it's actually a, once you open that door and you you start to have a, a a better and deeper understanding of what level of music and creative and artistic education is going on around the country um, it's it's like floodgates open. Suddenly, you just you don't feel like you're ever doing enough. Um, I feel that all the time. I'm sometimes feel guilty for going and playing concerts. I feel like I should just be dedicating time to 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 trying to to improve that. I think I get an enormous amount of um, in, encouragement through the people that I meet. The amount of people. I mean, speaking about the UK in particular. Um, this could be said for any country, but focusing on the UK, the amount of people that will give up just about everything in order to give young people a chance with music and a chance with with a kind of creative expression during their 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 young school years. Um, it, the sacrifices people make is is truly absolutely astonishing and. Um, I think I, I, I sort of switch between feeling extremely positive because of all of those people that I encounter and all of those people that I meet and I come across. I switch from feeling very positive to, to very negative because if all of that is going on and if there are countless papers and documents and statistics that say it is great for every young person to have an experience with the arts, an experience with music, an experience with, their, with an instrument, an experience singing. Why is it not available? To, it's just, it, it, so I go, from, I go from one state to the other. Sometimes I feel very positive about it. Sometimes I just feel um, that it's, it's, it's a tragedy I don't understand. I don't understand why something can be so obvious but so ignored and, and so, so hugely misunderstood um, but I mean all, all I can do is what I can do I, I speak to as many people as mm -hmm. I can I teach as many people as I can I try to be um, I try to talk about this as much as possible mm -hmm. I think it's, it's so often you come across people that just don't know they don't know that it would be great to have music in their school mm -hmm. uh, some people are just not aware of it and um, it's talking about it mm -hmm. yeah that, that can help <laughs> <laughs> We, we had quite an uh, active Twitter following this morning, so um, we have a, a few questions. Uh-oh. Um, don't worry, they're, they're mostly innocuous. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the first one we had, uh, has your career gone as you expected after winning Young Musician? Did you have a career plan in mind? Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> I mean, my parents are not musicians, and my whole sort of environment growing up was not not at all aware, not just of violin playing or classical music, but that whole kind of culture of, of appreciating artistic things. Um, that sounds really bad. I know my mum's watching at home. I'm sorry, mum. But, um, <laughs> um, but um, I, I really, um, I, I never had an awareness of, of what was to follow. I basically was quite good at the violin and liked practicing and once it was in my hands, I would keep playing. And, and that's sort of what I knew and all I knew. And that was the most important thing to me. At Yehudi Menuhin School, of course, you do get exposed to, to the whole culture and, and life of, of a lot of young musicians. Um, but that's very little, if, if, if not nothing, um, to do with understanding a career. Um, I think so many things have, have surpassed my, my expectations. Um, in terms of the opportunities that I've been given, but actually the only driving force of, of every um, improvement and development in my life and, and therefore in my career um, is, is my, my focus is, is on my playing all the time. And um, I, like I said before, the fortune that I've had um, in terms of opportunities to play and to keep playing. I mean, I'm fortunate to play the violin, first of all, because that's a very in-demand instrument. There are lots of 
orchestras and recital presenters that want someone to come and play the violin. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been I've been incredibly lucky. But uh, I think it, it I think for anyone who has those opportunities, the focus has to remain on the playing. It has to has to all come from that. Um, those of you who listen to Desert Island Discs, perhaps that this this might be a repeat question. I don't know. So if you were to play only one piece for the rest of your life, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did I answer that on this? Well, you mentioned the Archduke. Oh, um, that could be one of them, but I don't have that much to play in Archduke. <laughs> the pianist has much more to play than the violinist. Um, uh, oh God, I don't know. Probably a piece of Beethoven. I think he's he's if if there is such a thing, he's probably my my favourite composer. So mm -hmm. although that that Brahms G Major Sonata, that would be mm -hmm. close second. I think that's that has to be uh, definitely up there. Okay. Uh, we've probably got uh, time for a couple of questions. Does somebody have the roving microphone? Um, or you could shout. <laughs> Hi. Just, just here. Sorry, did you say uh, your, your favourite composer? Oh, um, my favourite composer. Oh, I said it was Beethoven. <laughs> yes, yeah. Okay. Jodie. Hi, Nikki. Hi. Um, <laughs> One is, how often do you come across a piece that you don't particularly like? And if you have to play it or you have to work on it, how do you, how do you go about it? Do you try and convince yourself and find something that you like about it? Or do you start figuring a way to fake that you love it and then <laughs> go on and perform it? Um, I, I would say... Um, I would say there have been few times that I've really had to continue working on something that I've hated. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite d difficult to come across because we have so much great music. You have like, you know, se centuries of, of people all over the world writing unbelievable. I mean, I, I, I just, I actually have the opposite feeling most of the time. There's just too much that's too great to ever get to most of it. Are you going through exactly that just now? <laughs> By any chance? Maybe. <laughs> I have a funny, I have a sneaky suspicion you might be. Um, I, I, think, um, I think that you can have a natural inclination towards different, um, different cultures of, of sounds and, and certain styles of music, but I would say that there's, there are a few things that we would be playing that you can't find a greatness in somewhere. And so I would definitely be in favor of looking for that. And also a really good and wonderful thing um, to do is to find someone else that loves it. Find someone that loves this piece that you are, I'm just assuming that you're not liking. Um, and, and just be around them play it for them, be around them listening to it, try to get into their mindset, because I'm, I'm sure there will be something about it that is astonishing and that is great and that's lovable. Um, and you, you might, you know, in, in five years, suddenly go, I can't believe I did not love that piece of music. Um, that could happen. So just, yeah, really try to, to, to be open. Um, can we have the microphone over here in the middle? Can ask how many hours you today, and um, which is your favorite concerto? And what? Which is your favorite concerto? What's my favorite concerto? Um, well, I practice va varying hours. Um, sometimes it's two or three, sometimes it can be most of the day, literally. So it, it just depends how much I have to work on, how much I have to, to learn. The times that I practice the most hours is when it's note learning. If I'm playing like three or four new pieces of music, you just, you keep playing them until you know them and that's it. Oh, could be, I don't know, six, seven, eight more six, seven or more. Um, and some days you're like rehearsing all, all day or recording all day and then you have to practice for another, you know, two, three hours at night because you've got to prepare the next thing. I mean, some, you, you get yourself into those um, circumstances. But I would say that, um, that the, the amount of time is so absolutely secondary to the concentration and to the, um, the quality of your practice, definitely quality over quantity. Um, I have, have very often decided just to put my instrument down and just sit and think for 
five minutes or 10 minutes or longer, I'm just working out what I'm doing. Because th there's so much physicality involved with playing that can actually get in the way of a, of a straight, linear, clear train of thought. Um, so, so sometimes just battling away and counting the, the, the minutes, is, is, it doesn't necessarily help. Um, it, you can, it, a lot of playing is problem solving, so really just apply your, your mind and focus as, as much as possible. Try to solve the, the problems. And, and your favourite concerto? Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> It's impossible. We have so many good ones. Violinists are really spoiled. I mean, I'm, Brahms, just because I'm doing it at the moment. <laughs> we probably have time for one more at the front here, if we could. Slightly odd question. <laughs> do, you, do you ever have a quiet or secret thought that you might go, as I think Joshua Bell did, with a cameraman and a recorder to a tube station? <laughs> um, do I? Um, I'm not sure it would be a terribly secret thought, but um, I'm sure I have thought about that before. Um, I might. Well, I mean, I, I like to like if 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 I'm in a, like a in a, in some kind of a social circumstance, and people would like to hear me play, and my violin's there, I'll almost always play. I don't really care where I am. Um, uh, yeah, that, that was an interesting. Didn't everybody walk past him? I, I think nobody really listened, which was very sad. So I might not follow in those footsteps. If I if I was not going to be listened to, then I might end up not not bothering to play to play on the tube. <laughs> Have you ever turned up at a dinner party and not wanted to be a violinist, wanted to be anonymous and something else? Um, as in, like a dinner party I had to play at? No, 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 no. Oh. Just a social gathering. I never don't want to be a violinist, yeah. ever. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy being a violinist, definitely. Great. Um, Nikki, it's been such a privilege, such a pleasure. Oh, thank um, you As for always, me. we could spend longer listening to you teach, we could spend longer talking. Um, so the bad news is we have to stop. The good news is hopefully you will be back here I before so. very thank long. You. But for now, thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you, and thanks all for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.